Okay, so here we are now with the still ideal, but something you can actually kind of build, vapor compression refrigeration cycle. So keyword here, vapor compression. I'm compressing vapor. I'm not compressing a vapor um, liquid mixture. So this is the idealized cycle that we're going to be using. This is, you know, it's a real thing. We will have these kind of components. It's just in real life, it's not as perfect as we're going to start with. Remember, we idealize things not because we just, you know, have our head in the clouds, to, but it's to give us an upper limit. If I can't do it with an ideal scenario, well, I can't do it in the actual scenario either. If I have to jump 10 feet across a gap and in my best day, I can only jump eight, I shouldn't jump that gap. It's not going to happen. So big difference here. The refrigerant is completely vaporized. And also we have a throttling device instead of using a turbine. So those two things make it actually work. So here's my cycle. So you can see right here, when I begin compressing it, I was already a completely a saturated vapor. And so I'm just compressing it the entire time, turning it into a superheated vapor. And then that releases heat, condenses completely into a saturated liquid. And that is expanded through some sort of expansion valve. Okay. So we got isentropic compression. Is it really isentropic? No, it's, it's, you know, it can be pretty good, but still it's not isentropic. Then we have constant pressure heat rejection. That's just going through the condenser. It's just a long tube that has chance to release heat. It wants to do that because it's at a pressure where it wishes to condense. Then it's throttled. What does that look like? There's a lot of things it can be, but it's just usually a thin tube. And that drops the pressure dramatically, which causes it to go, hey, I'm a liquid and I'm at very low pressure. I want to expand and turn into a vapor. And because it's doing that, it has to absorb heat. And so it'll absorb that heat all the way to here. So that's my ideal vapor compression cycle. Let me get rid of these markings over here. And we'll be dealing with this one a lot. As a note, this is what's mostly used for your refrigerator, for most AC systems, and for heat pumps. Like they're all coming from variations of this. Okay, it's, I mean, your refrigerator is almost exactly this. Like where the pieces are is about the only thing that's changed. Okay, so here's our TS diagram. So let's start doing our energy balance to figure out what we can know just from the start about our cycle. So first off. I have work input, I have no work output, I have heat input and heat output. And so because I have all those things, well, I should realize that I'm going to have some sort of change in enthalpy when I go from one state to another. Now, when I get back to the same cycle, well, it's a cycle, so it's going to be zero at that point. So what about coefficient of performance? Well, for refrigerator heat pump, remember, I'm trying to do two different things. Refrigerator, I only care about this, how much heat was removed from my food, from whatever I'm trying to cool. For a heat pump, I'm only caring about this, how much heat went into my house. And so to get those, all I have to do is take the difference in enthalpy between those states where it's being rejected or being taken in. So for my heat out, or I guess I say heat input into my house for a heat pump, that's the difference between two and three. What's the difference between those two enthalpies? For how much heat I am absorbing from my food and other things, for a refrigerator, that's the difference between one and four. Okay, what is that difference? And finally, what is my work input? Well, that comes in here during the compressions process. The throttling process doesn't have any work input required. It just happens naturally. And so my compressor is the only place where I have work. And so that's gonna be the difference between this enthalpy here and here. So I know all of those things. I can find all those points. I can find my coefficient performance. I can see how well my system is doing. As another note, um, we're always going to assume that this point one is a saturated vapor and that point three is a saturated liquid. So if you know the pressures, which you should, or you can find out from the problem statement, um, you should be able to find those just by looking at the enthalpy of a saturated liquid or of a saturated vapor. Now, the throttling process is irreversible, okay? And so that's why we have this line going to the side. Throttling processes are never isentropic, and so that's why we have that diagonal line right there. That's why we don't put it just straight down when we're idealizing this. And why don't we use a turbine to make it a nice straight line? It's because you just it's too complex. 
it's too complex. And a turbine would not work well with that much uh, moisture content. It would just destroy itself. Okay, so one thing I don't show you all that often is a pH diagram, a pressure enthalpy diagram. But it's kind of fun to look at every once in a while. So two things to remember is that when I'm going through my condensing coils and when I'm going through my evaporator coils, I am at constant pressure, which is why I have these nice flat lines for my pH diagram. The second thing, which is really cool, is that for a throttling process, that's the capillary tube right here, I am always going to be, well, okay, I'm technically not constant enthalpy, but it's one that's like, well, you know, like is 100 all that different from 99.999? No, it's, it's pretty much 100. So we're just gonna say that it's more or less the same enthalpy. Like, is that gonna be a diagonal line slightly? Yes, but it's so slight, why do we worry about it? So just depending on what diagram you use, pH, TS, PV, whatever you're gonna look at, um, you can have an easier time sometimes in drawing these pictures. Now, if you're used to one and you want to use that, that's all fine. Like in the end, for most problems, this is simply a way for me to um, do note keeping. It's a way for me to think, okay, where's the heat going in? Where's the work going in? All of that nature. Now, so far, this has all been idealized. I want to go ahead and show you what an actual vapor compression refrigeration cycle, actual vapor compression refrigeration cycle. I can say it would look like. So here it is. So you're like, that looks exactly the same. Yes, yes, the cycle itself is the same. It has the same components. But now let's talk about the issues we're going to run into. Because there's going to be irreversibilities no matter what I do. Um, a lot of this is just due to fluid friction, but there's also heat transfer, both to and from the surroundings. When I'm trying to cool up heat, more heat going in from other places, when I'm trying to um, release that heat, well, I have more heat going in from other places probably. So there's lots of, well, probably not in that case. But I'm having other things starting to affect my cycle. And so what does it look like? Well, first off, my compression, it's not going to be isentropic. It can be close, but it won't be isentropic. Okay, second thing, is that my evaporator exit? So right here, I might still have superheated vapor. So it won't be a perfectly saturated vapor when I'm there. At my condi uh, condenser exit right here, I'm not actually going to be a saturated liquid. I'm actually going to be subcooled, which doesn't do all that much for calculations, but the superheated vapor does. And finally, in the condenser and the evaporator, I do have a pressure drop. There's going to be a change in pressure due to fluid friction. So the pressure here will be different than the pressure right here. How much will that change be? Well, it just depends on how long the tube is. So here's a way that that can look. Okay, here's a way that that can look. These changes that have been caused by um, these alterations to my cycle. Okay, so first off, the numbers right here, they're not all lining up perfectly with our numbers over here. So don't get too confused with that. Um, we start at point one again, but you can see here that point one is no longer um, on that saturation curve. It's moved over because it's now a superheated vapor. Second, we're no longer perfectly isentropic. That would have been up here. Um, instead, we're going to be going at an angle because we have some irreversibilities in my compressor. When I have finished going through this place and releasing all that heat to my environment, I'm actually a subcooled liquid. So I'm down here at 0.5. And when I go through that expansion valve, I'm also having like changes in pressure. So there's a lot of stuff here that's happening. Okay, there's a lot of stuff that's happening as we go through this cycle. So because this is happening, what you might realize is that my cover performance is going to decrease. I'm going to have a decrease in my performance because of irre irreversibilities. That always happens. But regardless, I think you're less worried about the irreversibilities in your refrigerator and more worried about how do I actually calculate all this stuff in a real world problem. So let's jump into that in the next video. Thanks for watching. I'll see you all in a minute. Bye-bye.